In this episode, we're going to talk about the sustaining grace of God. His grace will be found to be sufficient. You know that to be true, and you want to pass that truth on to the people that you minister to. My name is Jeff Christensen. Welcome back to the Biblical Counseling Academy, and this is the podcast of the Academy. You know, the Bible is filled with real hope, real encouragement, and real assurance, the assurance that people need. When we feel hopeless, um, people feel hopeless. They need hope. They need real hope. And the Bible is filled with real hope. And you and I, as biblical counselors, feel hopeless when we hear uh, what some hurting people have to share. And there seems to be no answer. And yet we recognize the reason God has sent them our way is that why that we might be a channel through whom he can minister his hope. We're instruments of encouragement and assurance. You know, you and I, we might not have a clue what their next step today or tomorrow should be, but we can minister hope and encouragement and assurance, and that can change everything for them. We're talking about sustaining grace. We're going to look at second Corinthians chapter 12 verses seven through 10, right in that range. And, you know, the Lord allows tough things in life to just hang on And we might plead and he may not remove us from that circumstance or remove that difficulty from our lives. And I want to read what Paul discovered. And he'll share the Lord's amazing response regarding this in his letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's what Paul says. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I I pleaded with the Lord three times that that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I'm encouraged just reading that. And I bet you're encouraged as well hearing it. Because when things occur in my life, your life, the lives of those that we minister to that are thorns in the flesh, it's not necessary that um, we, it's not necessarily true that we don't know how to walk the Christian walk. It isn't really the case that we might be in some sort of sin. Paul wasn't. And he was finding a thorn in his flesh. It could be simply this. God is perfecting his strength in our weakness. I'm not saying I like it or the people that we minister to like it. But when I am weak, Paul said, I am strong. And the more we're aware of our weakness, the more we're inclined to rely upon his strength. You know, our weakness then becomes our strength. Our strength is often our greatest weakness. This is um, counterculture. This is otherworldly. This is uh, Christian theology. This is the way God works. God's ways are not man's ways. And when we think we can handle it in some area, we need to remember that even Paul, even Paul, was begging or pleading for relief in this situation. You know, he'd been used of God. Listen to this. Paul was used of God to minister healing in a number of uh, miraculous healings 
in the Bible, in his experience, he knew God could use him um, or that God had used him and that God could heal him. And yet he realized in his maturity, we got to admit one thing, Paul had some theological maturity. He had a walk with God. He understood God. God would reveal things to him. And basically the thorn in the flesh was to keep him humble. God had something else to show Paul. And it was not his healing power in this situation. It was sustaining power. It was daily grace. Sustaining grace is what people need. People that come to you and people that come to me that are hurting and they come to us for counsel. They may be experiencing this thorn in the flesh, kind of an issue, sort of like this. And I think that's why the Lord did not allow it to be spelled out in detail in the Bible, what the thorn in the flesh uh, was. And we have some idea of what it could be, but we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. So it it's left open so that the application could be broad. It could apply to your thorn in the flesh sort of issue. And when people come to us, we got to recognize God may be teaching them a deeper dimension of his power and grace sustaining grace, sanctifying grace, life giving, life changing grace. And you know, if you have a, a, a difficulty, maybe it's a battle or a problem. It just seems to hang on year after year. And it's been years. And you're working with somebody, a brother, a sister that has walked in the path of godliness, but this difficulty is just hung on for years. Sometimes we got to be careful that we don't get in the way and try to bring relief or try to bring answers or try to bring uh, solutions. And sometimes we need to leave it between those seeking counsel and the Lord for the application of this kind of passage of scripture, this verse, as we share it with them. Regardless, his sustaining grace will be found to be sufficient, but sometimes we can get in the way, right? We could run them over with our theological um, assessment. When God's trying to minister, look, my grace is sufficient for your situation. Sustaining grace to walk with you through life and empower you to deal with that problem day after day. And so this would bring, this teaching can bring, this is what you bring to people at the counseling table with your Bibles open is this hope, this encouragement, this assurance. Um, And this kind of ministry can really touch people. You know, I've, battled like you have. I've had personal seasons, feelings of hopelessness. You know, we're creatures, created beings that have feelings and God is a God of emotions and feelings. We just don't want our feelings to rule our life. But nevertheless, I'm weak in that area at times or at seasons where I become despondent, I not not at this point, and yet that time that few years ago when I had that that personal hopelessness, and I wanted to be fruitful, I wanted to progress spiritually, I wanted to be effective in the ministry, I wanted to survive supernaturally. And it, and it felt like without hope, as I had this feeling of hopelessness, it reminded me of how impossible it is to physically live without oxygen. You know, when you don't have hope, it's like not having oxygen. You suffocate. 
in both cases, spiritually or physically, right? Without hope, it's just hard to move on. There's, you know, and, and with, without oxygen, it's impending paralysis and death coming upon you. And when somebody ministered hope and encouragement of the Lord, it was there, they were being an instrument and they didn't even realize it. But it was at, at, at God's timing, at the right place, at the right time, and the right person, the cloud lifted. And, and they, they ministered the hope and encouragement of the Lord during that season. And it, it, was, a, it was a great blessing to me. And yet, listen to this. I have, since that time, ministered to discouraged, hopeless people and it has been a great blessing in the counseling ministry to watch god use me instrumentally and i don't know if is that why i went through these difficult seasons so i'd have the um you know the empathy or the understanding that i could really enter into their suffering with them i don't know you know i uh, in ministry, you and I are in ministry. You're in the biblical counseling ministry. You're a student of mine. And when you're in the ministry, when you're serving the Lord, or you're called to the ministry and you're being equipped in the biblical counseling academy, and you know the doors are open to the academy, I'd love to see you on the inside with our cohort this December, January into 2024. We're going to be enrolling and equipping another generation of biblical counselors. The next generation, it's time to, to rise up and be equipped. You know, if God uses you to minister to people one-on-one, -on -one, people knock on your door, give you a call, send you a text, you know, ping you on your social media messaging, and they want your advice, they want your help, and they listen to you and they look to you because they know you're walking with Jesus and they're, they're looking for... Um, God's help, God's way. They know they can find it in you and you sense you want to be further equipped to be used in this excellent opportunity and ministry of biblical counseling. I think it's a great um, open door for you to, to consider uh, enrolling, whether you just want to um, uh, grab some of the books and just learn on your own without enrolling in the tuition-based diploma program and certification, you know, which is a, which is a formal degree versus uh, just, you know, do something on your own. I'll help you either way. But when you're in the ministry, the discouragement that can come can be uh, substantial, right? And I think one of the, the, you know, I heard somebody say once, the number one destroyer of ministry. It wasn't heresy, you know, false doctrine, covetousness, you know, stealing money or things like that, or greedy for money. Both of those can destroy ministry, obviously. But they're not the number one destroyer of ministry. It wasn't power and greed I mean, there are power-hungry, greedy uh, men and women in ministry. I'll tell you that much. They're there. They are there, I should say. It isn't sexual immorality either. And all of those, yes, they do destroy ministry. But it wasn't power, greed, or those type of things. The number one destroyer of ministry, he said, this uh, astute, uh, you know, seasoned, I'll call him mature, I'm not going to say an old guy, but... He was older and he was mature and he walked with the Lord many, many years. The number one destroyer of ministry, he said, was discouragement. And, you know, and I think he was right because we've all had our bouts with it. I've battled discouragement. You know, I was blindsided by um, maybe my naivete about Christianity and leaders in ministry. You know, I was um, walking into the ministry with the expectation 
that these godly men and women were on fire for Jesus Christ and uh, they, you know, uh, from time to time I'd run into some people that would kick you in the teeth and punch you in the gut and <laughs> kick you while you're down. I'm thinking, who are these people? <laughs> you know, and, and people look up to them and they're prominent and you know, they're part of a, a you know, what do you do? You just learn who your, um, you know, who your master is. His name is Jesus Christ. But I've also probably the majority of the time have some really good godly friends and leaders in the ministry. I'm glad I'm part of a circle of friends and ministry leaders that are solid and love Jesus and, and, and will, you know, will stand with you through battles and will be mentors and disciplers and partners in the ministry. That's the majority of time. But I just want to say that discouragement can come when you're worshiping with somebody and you think, you know, I could have handled it if it was just somebody that I didn't know. But we stood in the house of God together. We worshiped together. And for this trial to come from you is discouraging. And I think that's the number one destroyer of ministry is discouragement. I, I don't know of anything over, you know, I've been three decades, 30 years of ministry in the word. And the mountains of discouragement I have faced. You know, looking back, I think, why were those such big deal? <laughs> why was that such a big deal at that time? But at the time, I didn't know. It just really hit me hard. Looking back, it was like, okay, that's lightweight. But maybe it's because, you know, mountain, uh, mountains and mountains of discouragement that I've scaled. I'm now scaling, you know, 14ers. I'm from Colorado, so I think of the 14-foot peaks that you can scale. And there's no oxygen up there, by the way. And you could get up there, you could scale that mountain and come down the other side. You know, but right now I'm doing 10,000 foot and those things, you know, are too much for me. I need to get in shape, but I think the Lord brings you in spiritual shape by going over a mountain of discouragement or a valley, however we want to look at it. And when we get through that, we look back and we say, well, I could keep going. Because God comes through. He's so faithful. And that's why you, who are a real godly encourager, you have a gifting, a calling. There are, you're going to find a line of people. You know, some of my students will say, you know, Pastor Jeff, I, I don't know who I'll be able to counsel. I'm glad I'm going through the curriculum. I'm glad I'm marching toward the finish line. I'm glad I'm earning my diploma, finishing my exams. I'm doing my practicum and getting my certification. I'm glad for all that. But when I'm done, will anybody come to me for counsel? I tell them, look, I've seen that over and over again. The good, godly people that are in the academy, people are hungry for what they have to offer. And there will be a line out the door and they won't have the time on their calendar to meet with everybody that wants to meet them. And you know, we've got, it's because we've got godly encouragement. And you know, we, we don't use the cliches of the world, the an, anemic inadequate cliches, like something, you know, um, every cloud has its silver lining, you know, just keep a stiff upper lip and you'll make it, you know, guys will tell me, just hang in there. Pastors will tell me that. And I, you know, and I love that I, their kindness and, but at the same time, that's not really what I want to say to some, just hang in there, you know, hang in where, and how am I hanging and what am I hanging on? And, you know, hang in there with the Lord. I get what they're saying. 
you know, it's like, you know, hey, just, you know, rub a lucky rabbit's foot, you know, or something stupid like that. It's anemic. The Bible, on the other hand, is filled with real hope, real encouragement, real assurance. We don't have to chapter and verse and, and, and be real sterile about it. We just build it into our language. Scriptural um, type communication you know like um when i am weak i am strong you know that in my infirmities in my trials the power of christ will rest upon me because his he told me his strength is made perfect in weakness and his grace is sufficient you know, we can learn to speak language that's biblical without being sterile about it and just using it in every day part of our conversation. Let me wrap it up here. When you and I feel hopeless ourselves, um, we know where to go. But a lot of people that come to you don't know. And that's why God wants to use you. And if you hear somebody hurting, there, there seems to be no answer. There's a reason God sent them to you. Because he wants you to be a channel, a loving vessel through whom he can minister his hope, encouragement, and assurance. And even though you might not know what their next step should be today, tomorrow, you can still minister hope, encouragement, and assurance and that can change everything for the people you minister to. God bless you. I love you guys. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. Do me a favor and share this episode. And, um, you know, if you know how to do the Apple, um, I don't know, thumbs up or five star or do a review, that helps spread the word. Our podcast is um, making an impact around the world. And I'm glad uh, that God's using uh, these uh, podcasts to minister help, hope, and encouragement. Love you guys. Bye.